Uh, I wanted to, uh, we're having these daily uh, encouraging uh, devotions, and today we're going to be looking at uh, two specific verses uh, in Isaiah. Um, just kind of dealing with the idea of relentless discouragement. Have you ever been in that place where you, it's like everything is opposed to you? Well, that's exactly the the verse that we're looking at today. Um, it's found in uh, Isaiah. Um, well, the story is from Isaiah 36 all the way through Isaiah uh, 37. Um, but there's only two real verses that we're going to be looking at. First off, let me let me kind of set things up, okay? So there's this there's this king. His, his name's Hezekiah, and he rules this tiny little this tiny little country. Hi, Melissa. Uh, he 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 rules this tiny tiny little country called Judah. And, uh, you know, things aren't going overly well uh, as he's attacked by this massive empire called Assyria. This huge army, they're just like heading down, you know, the coast, wiping everything out. And, and they, come, they come to Judah's, to this tiny little country of Judah. And uh, not great. So right there, there's bad news, you know. The, 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 it's like when you're waiting for an impending doom. This army's coming. Oh no, we better be scared. This army's coming. We gotta be scared. And so then they start killing everybody and, and wiping everything out. Well, now you really got something to scared because it's not rumor anymore. It's like it's it's actually happening. Um, and so then they come up to, they come up to the wall of of a city and they say, okay, let me just kind of break this down for you. We've been killing everything, destroying everything, and you're next. You are screwed. There is no hope of escape for you, and. Uh, nothing is going to save you. We've beat all those other gods over there. Don't let your king fool you into thinking that you guys are safe in there. So, not even your giant wall will save us. So then, then the, the king's messengers say, look, we understand different languages that our people don't. Why don't we speak in one of those other languages? And uh, then the Assyrian messengers say, no, 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 no. This isn't just for you and for your king. This is for everybody. And so they intentionally use the language that everybody is using to cause this mass panic. So now King Hezekiah has to deal with this army after it's been weeks in the making of this constant terror and also years before that of, will Assyria come down? And so there's, there's that. So he's already probably stressed out. But now this messenger is trying to turn his people against him. And you can just bet. You can just bet that some of his people were thinking, what is your deal, Hezekiah? Do you have a plan or do you just have us hold up in here to die? And uh, uh, so then um, they say, okay, no, your king's lying to you. Your god's lying to you. Nothing's going to nothing's gonna fix this. We, we beat all the other gods. We're going to beat you too. And uh, so... Then some, some news happens, they have to go and deal with a different city, but they end up coming back uh, and sending a messenger and saying, look, we're dealing with this other city, but we will be back. And when we do, do you honestly think that your God will save you when all these other gods couldn't save them? Uh, and so j just put yourself in the place of Hezekiah. You've got bad news. You're ridiculed for your decisions, trying to be the good, you know, the good, uh, the good king, but you're being ridiculed by everybody. Um, your enemy is turning people against you, uh, ruining your good name. Um, it, it, they start making fun of his faith, so it's almost like, well, maybe my faith is misplaced. Maybe I shouldn't trust in God. Everything is going wrong. There seems to be no escape. This is a massive hurdle. And I mean, we're talking about relentless discouragement. Person after person after person, thing after thing after thing. It's like, geez, would you let up a little bit? God, where are you in the midst of this? Can't you fix this? And uh, so then the first verse I want to look at is Isaiah chapter 37, verses 1 and 2. It says, As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. His first reaction, out of all this bad news, out of all this stressful situation, his first step is to go immediately into prayer. What? That is crazy. When I think of how I have handled bad news throughout my life, I mean, there's there, there's crying, there's weeping, there's gnashing of the teeth, there's binge Netflix, there's a lot of snacks, um, usually pizza, a lot of pizza, fried okra. Fried okra's good, if anybody wants to make me an ear, that, I, I would accept that. Uh, so there's all this, you know, all this binge eating, binge watching Netflix. But Hezekiah's first step in the midst of this impossible situation that God has not said anything on is to go to prayer. Wow. Wow, that blows me away. 
So he's in the midst of a hopeless situation, and in the physical, it was hopeless. But then in that moment, he, he sought God to give him a little bit of hope, and I, that just amazes me. So then, you know, after the second letter is received from the Syrian Empire that I was talking to you about, that takes us to verse 37, and this is the second uh, passage I want to read. Um, I'm sorry, not verse 37, verses 40 through 20, it says this, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. His first reaction after reading it, okay? Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim. Now what that means is um, they had the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and on the it was this basically this big rectangle box. And on the top of that box was two cherubim, which are two types of angels. And um, it was said that God spoke from the from from the um, from the middle there where the cherubim's wings met. Um, so when it says you who are enthroned above the cherubim, he's saying you who speaks from the ark of the, of the covenant, you who made this promise with us, you who you who gave us the law. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, which would thereby include uh, Assyria. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. What does he want him to hear and see? Check this out. And hear all the words of Sennacherib. See, that amazes me. Hezekiah wasn't saying, look at how righteous I am. Look at how I'm standing for you. He said, God, this is a terrifying situation. But in all of this, look at what Sennacherib is saying, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king's uh, of Assyria have laid waste all the nations of their lands. That's that's not an exaggeration. And have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Just relentless faith in the midst of relentless discouragement. Um, having having tabernacles and all those different things, law codes, these were all things that the, uh, everybody in the ancient world had. That wasn't anything new. But what made Israel set apart is they didn't have an idol for God. And in fact, they, they were actually forbidden in the law to make an idol of God. And so all these other gods, um, that, that's what Hezekiah is saying, all these other gods that people are worshiping, it's actually just a piece of, a piece of wood. But you are the only God who's, who's apart from all those other gods. You're living. And that just amazes me that his first step in all this relentless discouragement, relentless attack, relentless situation is to go straight to prayer. So there's there's three things that I noticed from this, or I'm sorry, four things that I noticed from this that kind of um, help me, and maybe they'll help you. First off, is it really a big deal? Sometimes we go to prayer distraught. And God, you know, oh, I just can't deal with this. This is the worst news in the world. But if we actually just stop and, and think, you know, this this really isn't that big of a deal. I'm just kind of blowing it out of proportion. Um, and it's uh, we can sometimes do that. <laughs> a lot of times, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I'm hinting, I'm, I'm winking. You, you see, we can sometimes do that all the time. <laughs> um, so first off, is it really a big deal? Then the second thing. God is master of answering the hopelessness. You know, we've got, how much more hopeless can this get? There's an army of hundreds of thousands of people waiting to murder you. There is no escaping this. It's not like you can just catch an airplane out of there or something. Like, you're stuck in this hole with this huge army arrayed against you. Your own people are getting ready to turn on you. It's mass panic. You've been concerned about the situation for months. Like, how scary and terrifying is that? This is actual real. And yet God speaks in the midst of this hopeless situation. Because remember, that it was a hopeless situation. But God is not confined to the hopelessness around us. And the story goes on, and Sennacherib's army is just wiped out. He, go, he ends up going back to Syria. And in the story, it says that he was murdered. It doesn't really say when. Well, in the Babylonian, or I guess I should say Assyrian records we found, um, he was, it was like, I think it was 20 years or something like that before he was killed. But moral of the story being, he was killed by his own children while he was worshiping his gods. And just the irony of that, that he thought he was bigger than God Almighty. And his own kids killed him in, in, while he was worshiping. So his, his own family slaughtered him when he was worshiping his own God, and his God couldn't save him from his own children. But the living God saved all of Israel, or Judah, from this massive empire. That just blows me away. And then the third thing, 
Take it to God, not to your group. Sometimes the first thing, <laughs> all the time, the first thing we do when we're faced with these terrible situations, we go Facebook rants about politics or whatever. Or we go and have, we have a certain group that we can say about how this person wronged us or whatever. And it's, we get this, this little sob story going on and people pat us on the back and then we feel better for five seconds and then we go right back to the situation. Sometimes that, that, that group is, is our family. People who we go and we just, we, we don't really fix the problem or we just bellyache about the problem and replay it and how we were wronged and all this stuff. Um, and, and that's one thing we see Hezekiah not doing. He goes straight to God God, this is, a, this is a situation beyond me. And you saw he did it two times, at the beginning of ver chapter 37 and then midway through 37. And his, his, his response was the same way both times, going straight to God. So remember when you're faced with these relentless discouragements, these times of overwhelming adversity. Maybe you have mental disorders, maybe you have physical problems, whatever. When you get these bad news, is the first thing to do is find hope in God. Because here's the thing, God won't always heal us. That's just a fact of life. God won't always heal us. But, and, and here's the thing, God will always go with us. See, everybody dies. Everybody dies. But we have a promise that goes past death to where even death's sting is an, is an ultimate. When we get into heaven, here's the thing, we are all going to be healed, absolutely 100%. The problem is, some of us have to wait until heaven to get, to get that. But either way, it's coming. See, that's a hope that transcends death. That's a hope that not even death can destroy and then the fourth thing here, faith is not you being scared. I'm sorry, having a lack of faith is not you being scared. Everybody gets scared. Everybody has moments of doubt. That, that's, not, that's not having a lack of faith. Faith is when God is your only option. Even if you're scared, even if, if, if it feels like you didn't handle it, even if you don't have the right prayer to give, even in all those things. Faith is not, I was never scared. I was never shaken. My faith always stood, that's not faith. In fact, that's, that's putting faith in yourself. Faith, faith is when God is your only option. God, I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. But I, I trust you'll get me through it. God, I'm scared, but I trust you're going to get me through it. And you'll find that every single time, God will get you through it. God will never abandon you. Never, ever. You will get sick. You will have times of discouragement. You will have times of doubt. But God will never, ever abandon you. And that. That is worth knowing.